This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. I'm Tina de Moor from Utrecht University, and I've spent most of my academic career on working on the commons, and I would like to share some of the results of that with you. And some of the results are actually very new, so you're actually witnessing a bit of a premiere here as well. I'm going to take you back in time, and quite a bit in time, but before I do so, I would like to straighten up a bit the discussion about the definition of what is a common. We've heard a lot of terms out there from all the resources that we share, peer-to-peer -peer economy, um, sharing economy, etc. And it's getting a little bit messy in the field of commons definitions. So I would like to plea for a bit more clarity here and take you from there into history. Actually, in academic research, quite a bit of definition making has already been done. And we've actually had a lot of definitions out there, such as common pool resources, common property regimes, and common pool institutions. They're all in the screen on the red bulbs. Um, those are actually the ones that define for me the commons, but they are actually, um, you have to see them in a connection. Before I tell you how you should do this, I would like first to explain you why we find it such a difficult concept. Why is it so complex to talk about the commons? I think first of all, that's the reason I'm standing here. There's a long history behind the commons. And of course, the longer something exists, the longer there's time for potential misuse of the term. Now, of course, some uh, people have also contributed to a bit of a confusion uh, here and there over the, uh, the past. The first to do so was Garrett Hardin with his tragedy of the commons. What he actually did, I think, was putting, connecting the concept of the commons to other forms of governance, other forms of um, regimes that are not exactly the same. So he, first of all, did a bit of a conceptual overstretch, I would call it, of the term by connecting open access features without any control on the use of resources, without any control on access of, of, to the resources. He connected that to the term commons, and that was very confusing, I think. Secondly, he used local examples for problems on a very global scale. Um, and that is problematic as well. As we know, most commons deal with local problems, um, but are not necessarily able to also deal with global problems. In his story, he also embedded a negative connotation to the collective use of resources. He was not the first to do so. In the 19th century, we've seen several people doing that, and even before that. But that negative connotation, of course, also was connected for a long time to commons, was then um, countered by Alna Rostrom in the 90s, as you probably all know, but what she also did was connected to, again, other types of resources that are local, but were previously not connected to the term commons, such as irrigation communities were then called irrigation commons. And today, people apply it to a lot of different types of other resources, such as digital resources, virtual stuff, etc., which makes it rather complex too. That's okay, but let's try to stick to a more um, structured view on commons. And that's what I'm trying to represent in this image. Uh, you see four, three balls, basically. The one, the green one, refers to the common pool, uh, the common property resources, as that a term that has been used in the literature. And that refers to the collectivity of members that we see when we're studying commons. The, the orange one refers to the resources, which are also in the collective form, and we call them in the literature usually common pool resources. Now the blue one refers to the place where we would put uh, common pool institutions, so the institutional part, the rules, the norms, the values that are needed to make sure that that collectivity of users manages the resources, that collectivity, that the collectivity of resources. So we're talking here basically about prosumers that use reciprocity through participation and that actually work in a group, resources with a uh, physically delimitation, and institutions that are based on self-regulation, self-sanctioning, and self-governance overall. As a definition, I would say we use groups of citizens creating and managing a collective good and or service, whereby the individual use right of the group members is set and limited by the collective decisions of all group, me of all group members. 
Now, of course, the commons do not exist on their own. They also um, are affected by many external um, influences like demographic change, political context, economic change. These also influence how a common on itself functions, how it survives over the long term. And that's where the history part comes in. How do we find out how commons can achieve resilience over the long term? How do they manage to deal with all those different in impacts from the outside? When we're looking at the historical development of commons, we can actually do so at various levels. We can do so at the macro level and look at waves of institutions for collective action. Now, that's a more general term, more neutral term, so to speak, than commons, um, whereby we look at explanations for growth and decline in the formation of new institutions for collective action slash commons. And then we can also ask ourselves if we look at the, the current interest in society for commons, whether that interest is actually so special, whether the current development of new commons is really so new. I will talk about that later on. We can also look at the meso level, which is the level of the institution itself, of the common itself. And as I said before, we want to know what makes a common a resilient institution, what makes it go on for sometimes centuries, what are the factors that involve it. One of the ways to look at that is to look for patterns in the evolution of commons and to look for patterns in the regulation that they use throughout that evolution. And one of the issues I would like to talk about it about later on is that evolution, but also sanctioning as an instrument to make commons resilient. Now we could also look at the micro level of commons, whereby we'll look at what people motivates to contribute to common or to free write. We're not going to do that today. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to do that in history because we can't ask people anymore why they actually are not contributing or are contributing to the functioning of a common. There's ways around that, but we're not going to focus on that today. In this webinar, I want to focus on uh, Europe and in particular the low countries because we have a lot of data for that. For other countries, the data collection is still ongoing. We hope to do the same in the future for those countries. And I'm going to focus on the macro and the meso level. Well, let me first take you back in time and quite a bit back in time. This is a graph that shows you the development of commons in uh, the largest part of the current Netherlands. And you see that from the late medieval period onwards, from let's say 11, the 11th century, commons have developed very rapidly. This is a graph of the new ones that um, emerged, not the total number. Uh, and you see that actually uh, the total number refers to the total number of institutions for collective action. So the, the, uh, the orange line, need to look at the blue line for now. That shows you that throughout the early modern period from let's say 11, 1200, commons emerged very rapidly in the Netherlands. And we can actually consider those um, as a form of collective action already in the late medieval period. Uh, land is from then onwards, increasingly managed and used in common. People go to the local lord and say, we want to use this in a collective, collectively because there's population pressure uh, and we want, to be, we want to use it, our agricultural system in a more efficient way. Um, beforehand, people used mainly their land in the form of, within the family or a clan or a tribe, but from the 12th century onwards, more or less, depending a bit on the region, you see an, a, a big rapid development all over Europe of more and more commons. Now that rapid development is stopped at the end of the 18th century, 19th century, when overall in Europe you see a top-down dissolution of commons, of institutions for collective action. Just a few examples, and each of these examples you can find, and actually many more, on the website that is described at the bottom of this um, slide. Um, this is a, a common in the Netherlands, in the eastern part of the Netherlands, which actually existed from the middle of the 15th century. And these are the documents that we use to study the commons. Uh, actually quite hard to read, uh, but we've done so and I'm, I'll be showing you some results of that later on. This is a, a, a common in uh, Cumbria and in, in, in England that existed from somewhere in the Middle Ages, we're not exactly sure when, which provided pasture land, peat, turf, bracken. And this is one in Belgium. Very nice one that actually still exists as a common today, actually one of the very few one that still exists in Belgium uh, and in the low countries overall. It provided pasture land and um, access to, for example, the, the river and woodland, etc. Now, if we put the graph of the 
commons, the agricultural commons, together with other forms of institutions for collective action, such as guilds, but also water boards in the Netherlands, we see there's a rapid development from the 11th, 12th century onwards, and that it is stopped at the end of the 18th, early 19th century. And that's when actually a totally new period in history starts, when there's a period of liberalization, but also the formation of nation states. Nation states decide how to deal with uh, their resources. And one of the measures they take is to dissolve most of the institutions for collective action, including the agricultural commons we discussed. Now, this was not the end. Actually, quite a, a, less than a century later, we see all over Europe a new movement of institutions for collective action, one whereby cooperatives are created, associations, cultural associations, for example, but also the labor unions emerge. That's mainly in the period 1818, 1920. That's the period when you see the biggest development in that. It's the period when you see, for example, the Rabobank, Bank, which is internationally active. It's a very large bank in the Netherlands. You see it emerging uh, in exactly that period. But then afterwards, it, the number of new uh, forms of institution for collective action uh, declined again. And now today, maybe we are witnessing a new gulf, a new wave of institutions for collective action. Um, at least we can say so for quite a few countries in Europe, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, they all like, witness a very impressive development in terms of new forms of cooperatives, for example. And especially they do so from more or less 2005 onwards which is quite striking because often this new wave of collective action is connected by the press, for example, by politics to the crisis, the economic crisis. But that took place only in 2008, 2009. And what this graph shows us, this graph of the new cooperatives per year since uh, the 1990s, is that um, the start of the growth of new cooperatives actually took already place before that uh, economic crisis. So it's not necessarily interlinked. What can we take home from this very, well, it's, a, it's not a very deep uh, overview of what happened over, the, over those thousand years, but my time is too short for that. But what can we take home from this? Well, if we look at the period before each of these waves of collective action, the one in the early modern period, the one between 1880 and 1920, and the one that's probably taking place today, history will tell whether it's a big wave or not, well, if we look at the period before that, we see that there's always a period of accelerated developments in the free market. Now, it is assumed that the free market will solve all sorts of public and private problems, but in the end, it doesn't really always do so. There are some sectors and some systems whereby it does work uh, through privatization and, and liberalization, but there's many domains where it doesn't work. It does not have the effect on prices, quality, or accessibility to resources that people assume it will deliver. So basically, you could say that these citizens' collectivities or institutions for collective action, they are a reaction to no or insufficient supply of, by commercial suppliers or also the government. The government and the market fail and then the citizens themselves step in. Now, for the second part of my talk, I would like to focus a bit more on the meso level, on the level where um, the commons as an institution itself are studied as an organization. And for that, we've done some very uh, labor intensive work on historical documents, but it delivers very nice results, which I really would like to share with you. What we've done over the past few years, and this is taking us back actually already 10 years of study, is we've composed, a bit like Alna Rostrom did with her data, database, we've composed a database of historical commons for three countries, the UK, Spain, and the Netherlands. There's actually other countries like Belgium and Italy involved as well, but the analysis is not entirely done for that yet. And we've analyzed in that database, we've uh, we first collected data on the regulation of the commons. Remember, I've just shown you this, um, this nice picture of a Dutch common and uh, the commons book next to it. Well, in that, those books, they collected all the decisions they made, sometimes from day to day on who could use how much from the common, um, who could not use the common, which time you could use it, etc. Now, those decisions were written down. We have the books of that, very old, thick books, and we use the data in those books to, uh, to, to bring all the regulation together, sometimes for hundreds of years of uh, commons regulation, and we analyze that in a very, very thorough and detailed way. We've uh, called this project the Common Rules Database. And in the meanwhile, 
we have another project with colleagues from Sweden and uh, other universities in the Netherlands. Very nice project called the MIDI project, Modeling Institutional Dynamics and Historical Commons. What we do in there is we use the data we collected for the other project with more sophisticated methods um, in order to make sure that we really get all the dynamics that are in the data and that, are, that are, haven't come out yet. Now I will show you some results. So what did we do? We first selected a lot of case studies, uh, approximately 10 per country. Uh, 10 doesn't sound a lot, but it is a lot because it's a very labor intensive task to do so. And we selected cases for, that existed for at least 200 years. And that had several rule changes in between those 200 years. We realized we create a bias with that, but that cannot be avoided because we're looking so whatsoever at um, commons that existed for quite a bit of time. But we use it, the variation within the success um, as a way to, to look what, um, what are the factors to explain the success of longevity of the common, of the resilience of the common. Now, um, we, didn't, we did a lot of description of the case studies, and all those descriptions are online for you to look at. And then we entered it in a relational database, meaning transcribing it all from the handwritten records, then translating it into English. So if you're interested in working with these data and you do not speak Dutch or Spanish or whatever, or uh, old English, you can actually use the data because we've translated it. And then we used a very extensive code book to analyze the data. So this is what the case study, uh, case studies geographically look like more or less. We have approximately 10 per country, but for some countries like the Netherlands, we also have a very extensive database of over, uh, in this case, 800 commons for which we have other data than just the regulation. And we'll look at the period more or less 1300, 1900. Those cases are all in between that period and all the cases focus on posturing. These are the documents we'll look at and the, the red quadrant in the bottom shows you that uh, what, what we call an individual rule. It's an uh, early modern uh, handwritten regulation for a specific common in the Netherlands. So we've entered all these individual rules as we call them in the database and then coded them. And this is one of the results of the um, analysis. One of the things we have been doing is um, we've been looking at how the rules changed over time on the basis of our database and how um, dense the distribution of those rule changes was over time. And what you see is that basically most commons are more or less constantly changing the commons uh, themselves. So they're actually very dynamic institutions, but there are differences. And in the Netherlands, it seems to be a bit more a, a continuous thing. There's also a reason for that. There's a legal difference in the Netherlands um, the, God, the farmers were actually entitled to change their rules entirely themselves. In the UK, they had to discuss this with the Lord of the Manor. So it was a bit of a, a more cumbersome process. Now, we've done further analysis with, uh, within the MIDI project on the basis of uh, the data for the Netherlands and the UK. We've done so for pasture and peatland cases. And we've been looking at more or less eight, well, at 18 cases in the project, which together comprised 3,775 300, rule changes. That's a lot. That's a lot of rules that changed over time, showing that these institutions were actually very dynamic. And then we used what we call the grammar of institutions, which is quite well known in common studies, to analyze these data. So what we did was we looked at individual rules, and then we tried to um, code these. For example, and there's an example for a Dutch common, no one will be allowed to use horses or yokes coming from outside of the mark in order to collect peat. This is a rule to make sure that people don't over harvest peat. It's a non-renewable resource, or at least a very slowly renewable resource. So people should be halted and keep it, taking too much peat for uh, heating their stoves or, or um, for other purposes in their household. So they have to make sure there's some restrictions and they do so by restricting it to the house, the horses that you can use or the yokes that you can use, um, only, you can only use your, your own. So you can't hire extra to make sure you can um, collect more. So then we code these data. It's about a resource in particular, peat, and there's a prohibition in this rule. And then there's another example, I, I won't be explaining that, but that's the way we actually coded the data. And we try to understand how this institution evolves over time and how it uses specific rules to deal with specific problems. 
And what we're actually looking for with the holy grail of the institution uh, studies is to what extent we see patterns in the evolution of these institutions over time. Now we do see patterns, that's a really interesting one. I wanna show you a few results of what this uh, analysis uh, brought us. First of all, we see a sort of U-shape in the evolution of these institutions for the two different countries. And we see, and that is very important, a similarity in the, uh, in the evolution. We see both for the Netherlands and the UK, a U-shape in uh, which types of rules and how much activity there was uh, during uh, the uh, life of the commons. We see a stronger activity at the beginning and the end of the commons lifespan. So in the beginning, they have to do a real effort to come up with good working rules. And at the end, basically what we probably see is a struggle uh, coming up with new rules to deal with problems, but in the end, not able to deal with them. Now, quite a few of these commons did not actually witness a tragedy. They were not um, dissolving out of themselves because it didn't function, but because the government was trying and often succeeded to dissolve them. Probably what we see at the end of this, uh, these graphs is a struggle against new government regulation that was threatening to uh, dissolve them and in the end actually did dissolve them. Now what is striking, as I said before, is that we see a similar trend in both countries, UK and the Netherlands. You may think that's logic, but it's not, because we also know that they are functioning in a different legal system, whereby one country is less, or giving less room to the commoners to self-govern than on the other, and UK is less, less, gives less room, basically, that legal system. And still we see the same kind of U-shape, and that's quite fascinating. Now, another an, a result that we see from uh, the study we just finished is that um, it also comes with increasing administration. Uh, this is a bit, this is well known in institution studies that over time, institutions often become more uh, bureaucratic and that's actually also what we see uh, in time. In, in time, there's an increasing focus on the commons administration over time. So the types of rules that deal with administration in making sure that the management runs well, that, that part grows quite a bit. But we don't see a difference between the both countries. Again, that's interesting. Um, so there this seems to be a sort of law, natural way of dealing um, with commons behind both. Another result that is really interesting um, and actually goes against what we already know within scientific research about sanctioning um, has to do with the development of um, sanctioning over time. In the literature, we usually assume that sanctioning is extremely important. Alan Rostrom also included it in her design principles list, in particular graduated sanctioning, she stressed. It is supposed to be very important sanctioning because um, we, also from a Western perspective, suppose that if we set rules, there should always be a warning finger saying, if you don't do this, if you free write, you will be punished, and this is how we will punish you. Now there's two things we discovered um, about sanctioning, which are actually quite mind boggling to some extent. One of them is that we see a, a decreasing sanctioning trend. So over time, even if the pressure on the common grows to dissolve, we see that there's a decreasing focus. There's less and less sanctions that are actually um, designed to make sure the common functions. In the UK, we don't see any development in particular about this. But what we also see, if we look a bit deeper, more at the, the type of sanctions um, that people were coming up with, is that there is actually very little graduated sanctions um, as, well, very little graduate sanctioning is done. Graduated sanctioning is a situation whereby you give people a chance to basically um, get their act together. At the first time, you get a fine of 50 euros, so to speak, the second time, 100 euros, and the third what time you do wrong, you're out. Now, that is something we very, very rarely see in historical uh, data, meaning that this is really a last resort system. On the other hand, Alan Rostrom did take it up in her list of design principles. So we're wondering whether uh, that design principle should really be there if you're took it, looking at resilience, at robustness of commons. Now, another very interesting result, which comes from another research, but on the same data, 
is that there's a negative correlation between the longevity of a common and the investment the commoners put the time and effort in designing the sanction. So the longer the common survived, the lesser interest they had in coming up with sanctions. It sounds counterintuitive if we, if we start from the, the premise that sanctioning is needed to keep a common alive. But what we do see among these commons that instead of investing their time and effort during meetings, for example, in coming up with sanctions, they spent their time and effort in coming up in meeting and talking about the problems and solving them uh, at meetings. And um, if you didn't attend a meeting, yes, then there was a sanction. That was important to be. That's where you make the decisions. What we also find in our historical documents that there's a huge variety in the types of sanctioning tools. So there's a lot of different types of sanctioning tools which deserve much more attention. Just to give you a few examples, uh, we see graduated sanctions, yes, but exceptionally, and usually only towards the end of the life of a common. But we see also, for example, uh, systems whereby people are uh, made responsible for not reporting free riding. So imagine you have a cow on the common and you see somebody else doing something entirely wrong, putting too many cows on the common, for example. And nobody who's responsible actually notices it. Well, quite a few commons had rules which said, okay, if you see somebody else doing wrong, you have to report this because it's in the collective benefit that you report individual misbehavior, also for you as an individual. So this makes a, a huge difference if you're a part of a calm and then you're really co-responsible also for other people's behavior. Those are things that we all we find in the historical data and which actually, um, well, in, should influence, I hope, in the future, our ideas about what sanctioning actually does. Now, I think I'm quite well on time. So I'm moving on to my conclusions. Um, I, what we see from this historical analysis, of course, there's much more literature out there that you consult, can consult if you want to learn more about um, the history of commons. Uh, the, the, the field of common studies has progressed a lot over the past uh, 10, 20 years. So um, if you're interested, um, there's a lot more material to read. So some conclusions. First of all, we believe that uh, as historians, um, you should, commons researchers, if they're looking at the resilience of a common, should take into account much longer period, not just 50 years, that's not enough. That barely covers the lifetime of people uh, active on the commons. No, you should look at several generations in order to understand how a common really functions and what makes it resilient over time. Which, which rules make it resilient, which behavior of commoners makes it resilient. As I showed you, we saw a decline in sanctioning, at least for the Netherlands, that is in contrast with some of Lynn Ostrom's design principles, also because it shows us that graduated sanctioning, one of the core principles of her list, is not as important as we've always thought, at least not in the long-term development of commons. Now, um, this made us think that um, it might, it is possible that um, what, what we see is a very long-term development, but whereas the case studies that uh, were used uh, to, to, to study the commons um, for in present day maybe capture a, um, a period in the life of the commons that's actually towards, a, in a very stressful period. So if you find graduated sanctions, this might be the indicator that you're looking at a very stressful period in the lifetime of a common, and it does not represent uh, the way in which people usually over very long periods of time deal with sanctioning. So I think we really need to reconsider uh, our ideas about sanctioning on the basis of historical material. And of course, what we uh, learn from these, um, these historical data sets and from this analysis is that it's very worthwhile also to look at how people dealt with natural resources, how they dealt with uh, depletable resources and what kind of um, institutions can help us uh, to build these uh, in a sustainable way and to make these functions over the long term. I will stick to that, but I would like to draw your attention as well to further readings about uh, this particular topic. Um, several publications that have been made in the course of uh, both projects, uh, which you can freely download from the website. Just click on the yellow links and you will find them. 
There's also more material on the websites of uh, the projects I've been talking about. And if you're interested in joining uh, one of our projects uh, at Utrecht University, but also in uh, collaboration with other universities across Europe, please do mail us. We're uh, very happy to talk to you and um, discuss possibilities. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Great, thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll remind our attendees that uh, at the bottom of your screen, if you scroll your mouse down, is the Q&A button. Um, if you can use that to type in your questions, I'll see them and, and be able to, to pass them on. Um, and it looks like we have a, uh, a question now. <clears throat> what is, sorry, make sure I get the, the gist of this. Take your time, Kobe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to what extent are, were the comments that you find people learning from other comments? Mm. Um, Good point. Were they copying uh, other, uh, other, other comments um, or were they all naturally coming up with all this on their own? Well, we still have quite a bit of research to do on this because um, the historical documents don't necessarily tell us whether they copied from one to another. Uh, but our assumption is that actually most of them uh, emerged quite autonomously. So they did not necessarily copy from each other. Uh, also in the cities, it's, it's, well, sometimes guilds, for example, that were collective groups of um, uh, craftsmen. They did look at each other's regulation, but they did, their regulation was made autonomously to a large extent. But quite certainly for the agricultural commons in the past, where it's quite certain that they are actually... Um, setting up their own rules. And we do see many similarities, but doesn't necessarily mean they were copying from each other. But it's possible they talk to each other, of course. We don't know necessarily. Um, and so we, we saw random uh, you know, jumps in um, frequency of comments. Do we have an understanding of the the elements of society that, that would create this need for, for common? Well, overall, I think, um, especially if we look at um, the, the forms of commons that are emerging today, they're usually reactions against uh, specific, specific malfunctioning of specific parts of society. For example, in the Netherlands today, we see a, a rather large uh, wave of new forms of care cooperatives which are very similar to uh, 19th century forms of uh, mutual care, for example. Also uh, set in a time when, uh, when there was increasing privatization, etc. And we believe that um, the origins of people, at least they also tell us as people who set up the care cooperatives today, they are um, originating, their, 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 their motivation comes from the fact that they're um, the state doesn't provide it anymore and the um, markets aren't functioning. And that also goes basically for, for example, if you look at the historical guilds as institutions for collective action, they were set up in the late medieval period and usually they're set up because they want to deal with the negative externalities of the functioning of the market. For example, if the market rapidly develops, uh, for example, in shoemaking as one example, then you will see a decrease of um, the price yeah? and you will see a decrease of quality uh, in most likely. And the shoemakers reacted against that and they said, no, we want to do this in a qualitative way. And we're going to set the price for it. So they made price agreements, they made uh, quality agreements, etc. And that way they try to control the market. So it's a way to deal with malfunctioning of the market and it's a way to um, uh, also to control the market but it doesn't necessarily function outside of the market. So there is still a connection with market developments. Great. Sort of interpreting this one. Um, what, so what type of, of, of rules, we've, we've looked at this, at this large database and, and, and gotten some sense, what types of rules are, are leading to the success, right? If you have a pasture and, and, and a lot of people, um, what sort of, of rules are, are you implementing um, that, that would help lead to, to long-term success? 
Well, I think it's actually more the combination of rules. Eh? Well, the, the thing is that when they come up with rules for managing those agricultural commons, they have to, they have to really look at every aspect of the common. So if you look at our database, you will see that there's rules about, um, for example, how many cows you can keep on the common, but there's also rules on how many horses you can keep. There's rules on the number of peat pieces you can, you can dig. There's rules on um, what you can do with the local river, where you can fish, etc. So actually, basically every aspect of resource use and access to those resources is quite strictly regulated. And I think that the, 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 the real success of these commons is to keep everything in balance. Let me just go back to the very beginning. I did not explain this because it was a bit too early in the presentation, but the real success of it, if you manage to, to, uh, to make a commons resilient, is when people are able to deal with the three um, factors that are in between the, the balls that you see here. For example, utility. If, if there's sufficient utility or usefulness of the resource for the users, they're going to be willing to participate and contribute to the commons. However, if there is not a sufficient equity, and then not equity in, in the, the more economic sense, but in the sense of uh, 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 allowing people to participate in the decision-making process, eh? the talking part, as I discussed earlier on, if you allow people to be part of um, the decision-making, then they, when they feel equally and, and equally understood also when in the common, then they will uh, refrain from free riding. So they will contribute if, it's you, you, is enough, if, if there's enough utility and they will refrain from free riding if there's enough equity. Now, there's also the part efficiency and that's about resource use. Of course, if the resource is not sufficient, efficiently managed and for example, if there's a rule saying, oh, everybody can put 100 cows on the common but there's only space for 200 and there's a lot more farmers than two, well, then you have a problem. Then the resource will be overused. So it's quite vital that the resources are not overused, that they're managed efficiently. Um, and if, that, if you can combine that with a high level of utility and equity, also in your regulation, then you will see that the commons are, uh, become resilient. If that's in balance, then they will become resilient. So the, 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 the key for success, I think, is on the one hand on reaching, um, reaching this balance, but of course you need the right rules to make sure that these balance are, this balance is, is achieved. One of the rules I referred to earlier on, it's that we, we call it a liability clause, or the clause whereby the reference to a rule whereby it says that if you see somebody else free riding, then you have to report this because it's, it's, it might be affecting the, the benefit of the collective as a whole. That's one of those things that stimulates reciprocity and that makes sure that uh, people are not free riding um, just like that because they, uh, they think they can. So it gives responsibility, ownership also to the users. Awesome. Uh, and and we're, we're nearing the end. I'll remind our attendees, if you scroll down, use the Q&A function um, if you have any last questions. Otherwise, I think we're, we're, we're good to, to start wrapping this up. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a, a few seconds to, to add any any further questions? Let's see if I got any. Okay. And no more. Okay. If, that's, if that's the case, um, then on behalf of the IASC and all the World's Common Week organizers, uh, I'd really like to thank all the attendees and team. Uh, for preparing, giving this, this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, in closing, we'd like to remind people of two upcoming IASC events, both of which are advertised on the top of the World's Common Week's worldcommonsweek.org website. Um, so in November, IASC is holding a, their first virtual conference. And then in July of 2019, the IASC is holding its biennial uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru. Um, the deadline for paper astra abstracts for that uh, is November 15th. Um, so if you're interested in submitting a paper abstract, November 15th, 
Otherwise, July 2019 in Peru um, is the in-person conference. Again, on behalf of the IASC and World's Common Week organizing team, thank you very much for attending. Thank you again, team. I hope to see you in Peru. Bye-bye. Yes. <laughs> I'll try. Bye, everyone.